coming to the most recent review in 2021 the recommendations from a review committee of jbjs in 2021 are that primarily dequervins tenosynovitis is to be managed conservatively even in patients who are in the third trimester of pregnancy or breastfeeding a corticosteroid injection has no contraindications and only after non operative treat, treatment is unsuccessful a surgical release of the first dorsal compartment is indicated and this can be performed by an open or an endoscopic technique and it's shown to have equal outcomes where but uh, endoscopic and mini invasive techniques have a uh, superior scar cosmesis and a uh, lower incidence of nerve injury coming to uh, scaphoid fractures so classically there is a history of fall on the outstretched hand with a tenderness in the anatomic snuff box and a restricted rom conservative management of the scaphoid has been long recognized but way back since 1991 the debate on whether the thumb needs to be immobilized in scaphoid fractures has been discussed in where in this study in 392 cases of scaphoid fractures half were treated with a below elbow cast without Im immobilizing the thumb and the others with the thumb spica cast and they found that the incidence of non union was independent of immobilization of the thumb another paper that is more recent published in the american journal of hand surgery in 2008 found that there was no significant difference in fracture angulation or rotation between spica or short arm cast second paper that found that immobilizing the thumb versus not immobilizing the thumb did not have any uh, role in the eventual healing of scaphoid fractures and in minimally displaced or non displaced scaphoid fractures recent reviews and previous literature have concluded that uh, while union rates and outcomes are comparable surgery definitely has a faster return to work and time to union with the same complication rate talking about percutaneous fixation the literature is currently in support of a dorsal anti grade approach versus a volar retrograde approach and it seems that a dorsal anti grade approach is allowing surgeons the chance to achieve a screw placement that is central in all three of the scaphoid regions in this article on displaced fractures of the waist of the scaphoid meaning all the fractures are displaced they found that generally parmar exposure is better as it uh, restricts injury to the blood supply but very proximal fractures require a dorsal approach and in the results that were published of all displaced fractures patients treated with below elbow and above elbow casts also achieved union rate somewhere between 70 and 90% while uh, open surgery had slightly higher union rates with uh, percutaneous fixation achieving almost 100% they also had their own set of problems so these are some pictures of a scaphoid fracture treated percutaneously from the volar dorsal uh, the volar approach so scaphoid non union also uh, will have a similar presentation with a past history of fall on the outstretched hand and tenderness with a loss of range of motion carpometacarpal arthritis so generally there will be chronic pain at the base of the thumb that is radiating to the thena remnants pinching aggravates this pain and it affects activities of daily living the base is a uh, frequently prominent at the first cmc joint it's tender a grind test is also positive and forced adduction is painful so a grind test is performed by rotating the first metacarpal while applying an axial load to the joint and this is frequently painful in cmc arthritis uh, cmc arthritis has been classified by eaton et al where in stage 1 there is only a slight Uh, involvement of the joint in stage two, the osteophytes, if they are present, are less than two mm. Stage three has a marked narrowing and sclerosis with more than two mm osteophytes, and stage four is a pantrapezial kind of arthritis. So this is an X-ray showing a stage four disease of the CMC joint, and 
multiple surgeries have been recommended and no single procedure has demonstrated su superiority but the crux is that trapeziectomy must be performed whether it is followed by tendon interposition ligament reconstruction a combination a tight rope or arthrodesis in younger individuals that have higher functional requirement uh, for the first few procedures the trapeziectomy is the most essential component so this is a surgery that is recently gained more acceptance where there is suture suspension between the first and second metacarpals and it is said to have good results uh, stt arthritis is kind of a pan arthritis involving uh, the scapho trapezial and trapezio trapezoid articulations that is diagnosed by uh, a specific stt view with the wrist being in extension and ulnar deviation coming now to uh, specific cases so my first case is a 40 year old female who had radial sided wrist pain with a positive finkelstein's test and conservative therapy along with a local injection had steroid of steroid had failed and so we considered this patient to be a good candidate for surgery so initially we palpate for the apl and epb in the first compartment while asking the patient to extend the thumb local anesthetic is infiltrated in and around the compartment and the limb is exsanguinated a transverse cut is made just over the most prominent part of the bulge and the dermis is incised after this incision is spread the radial cutaneous nerves have to be dissected and protected which which are structures that could be injured uh, during this surgery and these nerves once identified need to be protected after we protect these nerves the first compartment is identified as a hard bump incision is made in the first compartment and the abductor pollicis longus extensor pollicis brevis are seen and opened up and freed and at this point it is best to ask the patient to extend their thumb actively and see if uh, their symptoms have been relieved to an extent or not my second case is of a 60 year old female who had pain at the base of the bilateral thumb since 3 years with a positive grind test on both sides her activities of daily living were uh, severely affected and hence this patient was planned for a bilateral ligament reconstruction with a tendon interposition as we can see in a clinical photo over here there is a prominent bump at the base of the carpal metacarpal joint so these were the x rays of her right hand showing involvement of the first cmc joint with a uh, large osteophytes and a similar picture was found on the other side where again the joint was affected and fairly large osteophytes could be skin which was directly putting this patient into at least stage 3 or stage 4 of the classification so in this surgery the goal is to suspend the first metacarpal and this is done by taking a split fcr uh, and routing it through a tunnel in the first metacarpal and then this end of the fcr can be sutured again partly to the apl and the uh, fcr that was uh, that was routed through so these were our surgical landmarks and now i'll just be sharing a short video so the fcr tendon has been identified so once this uh, tendon was stripped and identified a uh, split is made through uh, the fcr tendon and half of the tendon with 
is reserved and now this tendon will be uh, harvested and tried to be rerouted through a dorsal incision. So once this tendon has been uh, taken out from here, the idea is to have a drill hole through the first metacarpal base and this tendon will now be routed through that uh, drill hole and then it can be fastened and fixed to uh, both the uh, uh, abductor pollicis longus as well as the remnant of the FCR. Yes, as we see, the tendon has been pulled through and it will now be fixed through a drill hole in the first metadaster. I mean, metacarpal, sorry. This was our patient's post-op x-ray after the trapeziectomy and the uh, LRTI procedure. And this was the x-ray on the right side. This is a second patient, not the same patient. So this was the incision made on the dorsal side. The thenar muscles are reflected. A trapeziectomy is done and half the FCR is dissected and through a drill hole in the first metacarpal, uh, the tendon is rerouted and a ball of the palmaris longus can also be used to fill the space uh, that is left by the excision of the trapezium. And uh, this procedure after... Uh, so in both these cases, our patient was quite happy with the results and uh, they were able to get back to their activities of daily living. And at three month and six month follow-up, they had significantly better movements of their thumb and uh, they were overall very satisfied with the procedure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Manan Shah. Uh, before we go on to the... Uh... Manan, yek yes, one, yek one, is, there is a controversy between literature on three points, which I wanted to get the answer from you. Yes. Whether, what is the position of the thumb while doing a scaphoid uh, fracture immobilization one? And as you said, the thumb, whether it is immobilized or not, that is also a controversial issue. If you don't uh, immobilize the thumb, then where is the immobilization at the fracture site? It is at that not using the plaster. And uh, what about the position, as I said, and what about uh, it should be above elbow plaster or a below elbow plaster? And in, in which position, supination, pronation, and what should be the ideal position for shockhide uh, immobilization? I want to get this uh, clarification from you. Yes, sir. So, uh, sir, from what I understand from reviewing the literature is that, uh, sir, most of the meta-analysis and reviews of articles have concluded that whether the scaphoid is immobilized in an above elbow plaster, a below elbow plaster, or a thumb spica yeah. plaster, the complication rate and the non-union rate do not vary whatsoever. They have found that uh, long-term above elbow plasters additionally have a, a, a complication of associated elbow stiffness and no that is not the, my point that is already in the literature what you will prefer that's what after going through your presentation if you get a fracture of this cuff acute fracture in what type you will immobilize and what is the clarity of your immobilization and treatment plan in acute fracture. Sir, if not I have to treat a scaphoid fracture, if it is undisplaced and I am treating it conservatively, then I would prefer to treat a scaphoid fracture with a thumb spica cast with immobilization of the thumb because while there is literature favoring equal outcomes, there is not a single paper that I have come across that is saying that thumb immobilization has unfavorable outcomes. 
compared to below elbow or above elbow cast. It is always that we are comparing the below elbow and above elbow cast to the outcomes of thumb spike. And as I have been trained and I have seen most patients treated conservatively with thumb spike or cast have very good functional outcomes and optimum return to activity and range of motion. So I would feel that if I had to treat a thumb uh, uh, undisplaced scaphoid fracture conservatively, I would definitely opt for a thumb spike or cast because I believe that immobilizing the thumb would definitely add to stability at the fracture site. Okay. Next, next. Yes. If there are no questions from any panelist, also they can ask and clarify the whatever the views are there. It is not that the only the presenter should present. Uh, we no. So also... what is what is Doctor Sparak's take on uh, uh, Gadigoni uh, sir's uh, question? So number one is above elbow cast is not recommended in scaphoid fractures. We give thumb spike a cast with interphalangeal joint of the thumb free. Okay. And the pulp of the thumb should touch the pulp of middle and ring finger. That is the position of thumb spica cast with the wrist in not too much of dorsiflexion. So if you ask me the angles, wrist in just neutral or 10 degree dorsiflexion with thumb spica cast, leaving the IP joint free for the movement so that the person can touch the pulp of other fingers with the thumb. That is my uh, way to give a cast. Is it that glass holding position what you are talking about? Yeah, glass holding position. Glass holding. Correct. <clears throat> and once you give the cast, always take one x-ray. Uh, you know, sometimes it's a rotated view because in case of scaffold fracture, we never take an x-ray in the position in which we give a cast. So and how long do you, you recommend? Check under, you know, it all how depends do on you... the fracture yeah. pattern. Two months two months of cast. So I always discuss with the patient whether you want a cast for two months or a percutaneous screw fixation with three weeks of immobilization and then early mobilization. But we, if you are treating a patient in plaster, then two months is the time that we should keep the plaster. Right. So there's one question if I, if I can ask. Manan. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Manan, have you come across any case wherein you have got subsidence of the after the surgery for the first CMC joint? Once you have put the you know, like a ball of a palmaris tendon, thereafter, after a couple of months or maybe after a year or so, have you noticed any kind of subsidence of that particular uh, first metacarpal beyond that whatever position you had achieved at the time of surgery? Uh, sir, personally. In the cases we have done, we have not observed any subsidence yet, but it's definitely a reported complication in the literature and otherwise. And uh, in many cases, from what I understand, it has said sometimes it's not symptomatic or the patient doesn't have major problems with a little bit of subsidence. And uh, there have also been procedures described for a second surgery using other tendons to kind of uh, re-elevate the metacarpal to an appropriate position, but fortunately, we have not ha had to perform any of these uh, procedures so far. Can I can I come in for a moment, please, Abhijit Mahegaukriya? Yes, sir, so, yes. So uh, there are several ways by which CMC arthritis can be treated. Uh, it could be just a simple resection of the trapezium without any ligament reconstruction, so simple trapezectomy. You can do a hemitrapezectomy. You can do a trapezectomy and ligament reconstruction. You can do a trapezectomy and the mini tight probe that Manan had showed earlier on. And there are several studies in literature that show that there is no um, difference or no significant difference whatsoever between whatever procedure you do. Now, besides the tendon, you could, the anchovy that Manan showed, uh, the ball that we are talking about, there is also an artificial spacer that is available, which is called as the artelon prosthesis, which is made of Teflon. However, it does cause some osteolysis and does not, and some allergic reactions. So perhaps does not find a lot of uh, favor amongst uh, the surgeons. 
And then we also have some pyrocarbon spaces that have come up. And then there is also arthroplasty. Now that is not in the scope of this talk. However, suffice it to say that whatever you do, either a complete trapezectomy, a hemitrapezectomy, ligament reconstruction or not, and this procedure is called as the Eaton Littler or the Burton Pellegrini procedure, there is no significant difference between whatever you do. There are people who have just inserted gel foam. There are people who have just inserted a tendon anchovy. Uh, so the interposition is really not the big deal, the big issue. What is perhaps important is that uh, the volar oblique ligament has to be maintained when you're doing the trapezectomy, not damage that, and that provides the stability. And then just to complete the discussion, there is also now uh, some interest in arthroscopic management or arthroscopic uh, excision of the trapezium along with uh, either an interposition arthroplasty or just a simple hemitrapezectomy, uh, which is also called as a hematoma uh, uh, arthroplasty. So I hope that answers your question, sir. Yeah, uh, just, just a comment. These patients are really very, very happy after doing these surgeries. I mean, uh, they're uh, very satisfied what we are seeing uh, uh, from all of our surgeries which we have done. So uh, should we move on to the next speaker? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So I invite Dr. Julie Matre to uh, start her topic. A very good evening to one and all present here. Myself, Dr. Zuili Matre, and today I'll be talking on the topic of central wrist pain. So basically, I'll be talking about what are the structures which are involved in this region, what are the differential diagnoses based on these structures. Then I'll be discussing two topics in detail, that is the Kinebox disease and the lunate and perilunate uh, dislocations. And to end with, I'll be showing some few cases which we had done. So to begin with, the bony structure that the, which are involved in the central region from proximal to distal are the distal end of the radius, the lunate bone, the capitate bone, followed by the second and the third carpometacarpal joints. And the ligament which we are concerned about is the scapolunate ligament. So based on this, if we uh, get a patient in our OPD with a central wrist pain, based on the structure, we can think about the differential diagnosis which the patient could be at. So firstly is the radius bone. It could be a fracture of the distal end of the radius. Or if it is a young patient, it could be a gymnast wrist, which is caused due to repetitive trauma to the wrist, thus leading to physial injury and the patient presents with the wrist pain. The next bone which we saw was a lunate bone, which could either present as a fracture of the lunate or a perilunate dislocation or an avascular necrosis of the lunate bone. That is the kind box disease. The third structure which I mentioned was the capitate bone, which uh, usually a capitate fracture is missed initially and later on the patient can present with a, uh, with a pain in the wrist. The fourth structure was the carpometacarpal joint. If there is a bony outgrowth, as we can see in the clinical photo as well as the x-ray over here, it is called as carpal boss. If it is asymptomatic, it can be left alone. However, if it is causing any pain to the patient, it could just be excised. Also, there could be any arthritis in the carpal bones uh, due to a previous trauma or injury to the wrist. The fifth structure that we are looking at is the scapholunate ligament. A uh, scapholunate injury, uh, as we can see on the x-ray, shows us a Terry Thomas sign. And the most common thing which we see in our, in our OPD for a wrist pain, central wrist pain, is a ganglion. Other than that, if the bony or the soft tissue structures are not involved, could also think of median nerve involvement causing carpal tunnel syndrome and in turn presenting as a central wrist pain. So this is a slide which summarizes the structures as well as the differentials which we should think of when a patient presents with central wrist pain in our OP. Now moving on to the topic which I'm going to discuss today. First is the Kinebox disease. Kinebox disease is basically the avascular necrosis of lunate bone. Now the causes of, due to which it is there it could be a repetitive trauma to the wrist due to the occupation, or there is a theory of a vascularity pattern. Now, there are three vascular patterns, as you can see here. There is a Y type, I type, and X. If a patient has an I type of vascularity pattern, he is more prone to having an avian of the lunate bone. 
and the last theory is that if anything causes a negative ulna variance then there is increased contact of the lunate bone with the radius causing repetitive trauma and in turn causing an avascular necrosis of the lunate bone so how would this patient present to us in an op he could either come with an insidious onset of pain or a decreased range of motion or stiffness in the wrist or a decreased grip strength the first investigation which we would like to get done is obviously an x ray and in the x ray the most common finding is a dense lunate or the sclerosis of the lunate which is seen in this x ray other than that if nothing is found on the x ray we could go on and we could go for an mri scan which would show a lunate necrosis or the destruction of the tissue so uh, based on this imaging there is a classification for kinebox disease uh, st- in stage 1 the x ray is absolutely normal only a bone scan can pick up the avascular necrosis as shown here in the type in type 2 the there is sclerosis of the lunate as we saw in the previous x ray in type 3 the lunate is seen collapsed on the x ray now if it is not associated with a fixed scaphoid cuff- rotation then it is denoted as 3a however if it is associated with a fixed scaphoid rotation then it is denoted as 3b and in stage 4 there is severe lunate collapse as we can see here and the, there are osteophytes in other carpus denoting arthritis of the surrounding joint now how would we treat what are the treatment modalities available for this there are three treatment modalities the first one is a mechanical or lunate unloading if either the radial or the capitate bone are causing repetitive trauma to the lunate then a shortening osteotomy of either of the bone would un- will unload the lunate bone and here is an example showing the same in the left wrist as you can see here there is collapse of the lunate as compared to the right one which is absolutely normal and for which we have done a radial shortening osteotomy as well as fixation of the scapho capitate uh, bones thus unloading the lunate bone and this is an example of mechanical modality the second modality which we are talking about is revascularization procedure this could be either done by a distal and radius core decompression or by using various vascularized bone grafts and the third is the salvage procedure sorry and the third is the salvage procedures which involve the proximal row carpectomy fusion of the wrist or partial fusion of the wrist and complete wrist arthroplasty or lunate arthroplasty now this is a slide which is showing proximal row carpectomy wherein the scaphoid the lunate and the triquetral are all excised and the capitate is now articulating in the lunate fossa of the radius and the mobility is intact after this procedure and this is another salvage procedure which is wrist arthrodesis where the wrist of joint is fused and the mo- mobility is affected in this procedure now to summarize it all based on the stage we can uh, decide what treatment is to be given to this this patient so in stage 1 only immobilization with nsaids would suffice in stage 2 where there is lunate sclerosis seen on the x ray we could either go for a mechanical procedure or revascularization procedures or both combined similar applies for stage 3 3a however for stage 3b and 4 we have to go for the salvage procedure now uh, what exactly is to be done there are uh, two articles which i want to share with uh in this first article show, uh, is from the journal of hand surgery and it uh, shows us that whenever we are doing a revascularization procedure if it is done with a joint leveling procedure it gives better outcome as compared to uh, revascularization plus any pinning procedure and the second article is specifically for the type 3b kinebox disease which compared stt arthrodesis versus a proximal row carpectomy and in conclusion they found out that after one year the proximal row carpectomy gave better results as compared to the stt arthrodesis so now moving on to the second topic for today it is the lunate and the perilunate dislocation this is the basic uh, structure showing the normal anatomy and the difference between a lunate and perilunate in which the lunate dislocation the lunate is out of the ra- uh, fossa and in perilunate the lunate is articulating with the radius however the surrounding carpal bones are dislocated so uh, depending on the in, uh, progressive instability mayfield has classified it it goes from radial to the ulnar side as we can see in stage 1 only the scapho lunate ligament is affected in stage 2 along with the scapho lunate the capito lunate ligament is also disrupted 
in stage 3 along with these two the luno triquetral ligament is also torn at this stage when the all the three ligaments are torn that, that is what we call it call as a perilunate instability or a perilunate dislocation however if it reaches stage 4 and the dorsal radiocarpal ligaments are also disrupted then the lunate moves out of its fossa and that is when we call it as a lunate dislocation now whenever we talk about perilunate dislocation we often come across the term dc and vc what exactly are they in normal anatomy the lunate uh, the scaphoid has a tendency to move volarly and the triquetrum has a tendency to move dorsally however because they are attached by ligaments they are in the normal anatomic position now in stage 1 where we saw that there is a break in the scapholunate ligament the lunate bone along with the triquetrum moves dorsally and in stage 3 where the luno triquetral ligament is also torn the lunate moves volarly so basically what we can uh, differentiate is on an x ray if we see vc as compared to a dc it is a severe injury then VC is a more severe form of injury as compared to DC. That is what it basically signifies. So there are two tests. One is the Watson test to test the scapholunate ligament. And the other one is the Shuck test to test the perilunate. That is the for the lunar triquetral ligament. Uh, then we'll go for, in when we go for x-rays, if it is a lunate dislocation, we'll see a spilled teacup sign wherein the lunate is uh, out of the lunate fossa of the distal end of the radius. Also, we can see a triangular appearance of the lunate, which is called as the pi, uh, piece of pi appearance. In case of perilunate dislocation, these are the gallula lines, which are often smooth. However, if there is any break or the smoothness is disturbed, then we should look closely for any carpal fracture or any carpal instability. And uh, Terry Thomas sign, as we all know, it is seen in a scaphoelunate disruption. So if there is any dislocation, obviously the treatment is reduction. So there are two methods to reduce it. One is the lever technique, which I'll be showing, discussing in the cases further. Uh, and one is the external fixator technique, wherein you apply external fixator and based on the uh, ligament root axis and manipulation, uh, the dislocation is reduced. So moving on to my cases. The first case is wherein the patient presented with a missed perilunate dislocation. He was uh, diagnosed outside for a distal end radius fracture, also fixed for it, but he still had pain in the wrist and that is why he presented to our OP. This was the uh, x-ray of that patient where the st uh, styloid process is fixed with KY. However, the lunate fossa which is spilled outside, as you can see in the lateral, the teacup spill sign, there is a hollowness below the capitate and the gallula lines are also not smooth. So the uh, lunate dislocation was missed. For this patient, we decided to go through a dorsal approach. Uh, the dorsal approach was taken in between the fourth and the second compartment. After that, uh, the distal end, uh, distal end of radius capsule was identified and incised. At this step, we made sure to protect the DRUJ. Uh, after that, the capitate was visualized and then using a spike as a lever, it was reduced back into position and that is how the reduction for this was done. This is the lever technique, which I was talking about previously. Uh, and how, when we are uh, reducing, it should be done very slowly so as to preserve whatever the cartilage surrounding these bones is present. And uh, later on after reduction, it was fixed with K wires by fixation of scapholunate, triquetrolunate, triquetral capitate and scapho capitate fixation was done and the patient was immobile and the wrist was immobile. Coming to my case two, uh, we had a patient presenting with history of slip and fall. He had pain and swelling in the wrist. Also, it was associated with tingling in the index and middle finger. On examination, there was a swelling and deformity as well as tenderness on the wrist. This was the x-ray of the patient where you can, as you can see, the lunate is out of the fossa and the gallula lines are also not seen properly. Since he presented with a tingling numbness, it obviously indicated that the median nerve was compressed and hence he was immediately taken up for OT. And for this patient, we chose a volar approach because uh, we had to decompress the median nerve as well. Through the volar approach, the median nerve was decompressed. Uh, all the flexor tendons were later retracted radially. The carpal ligaments were identified the lunate bone was identified and it was reduced back into its position and fixed with immobilization later. Uh, 
coming to the third case, uh, there we had a patient presenting with history of fall three months back. On examination, he had swelling and deformity at the wrist. There was tenderness present, and there was a decreased range of motion at the wrist. Uh, this was the X-ray of that patient. As you can see, the uh, gilula lines are not smooth, and there is a teacup spill sign. And also, if you see closely, there is osteophyte formation indicating arthritis of the carpal joints. So, for this patient, a proximal row carpectomy was done. And post operatively, as you can see, the capitate bone is uh, articulating in the lunate fossa of the radius. Uh, that is the proximal car row carpet. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Zoidi. Can you please, uh, stop sharing your screen so that yes. we can have a discussion? Thank you. Julian. It is a wonderful presentation. I must compliment both the speakers. Actually, um, you have a very good future of presentation <laughs> in a further uh, seminars. Wonderful presentation of uh, both uh, junior colleagues. I must compliment. Uh, Thank you. I completely agree with uh, Dr. Gadegone, sir, because uh, in your first slide, you mentioned you are a senior resident. You know, yes. to talk about uh, scaphocapitate, lunotraquitral, these terms you spoke so easily. That means Dr. Ashok is training very well to all of you. <laughs> I am happy. I mean, are these, these wordings are, you know, even for trained orthopedic surgeons to speak flawlessly. Is, uh, and, and, and difficult to, difficult to uh, present a sequence of events in a, this uh, perilunate and lunate uh, dislocation. Abhijit must be well versed with this, all these things. And how yeah. it is very difficult to remember which ligament goes up, down, and so many other things. But she has put it so nicely. And therefore, I must compliment you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> so is there any... Abhijit, you want to comment something? Um, no, not really. I think it was a very good presentation. She touched all bases, covered all the causes of central wrist pain pretty... Uh, elaborately. Uh, in fact, uh, I would like to ask uh, Parag to uh, let us know if he has any comments or any uh, inputs regarding the talk. So about the for only three things that a general all orthopedic surgeon should know that apart from, I mean, whenever uh, we see even any distal radius fracture x-rays, which we see almost two times in a week, you please go through gilula lines in all distal radius fracture. That is how you make a practice of, you know, not missing uh, lunate, perilunate dislocations. Otherwise, these injuries do not come frequently. So simple three gilula lines, just ask our junior colleague or our co own colleagues, you know, these gilula lines are looking very good to me. And in lateral x-ray, always look for whether the third metacarpal capitate lunate and distal radius are they in a straight line or not if we make a, this habit in every distal radius fracture case hence further you will never miss lunate injury or a scaffold fracture you know there are 15 one five percent cases in distal radius fracture scaffold fractures are also common and you will see terithomus sign like a scaffold unit dissociation in 15 percent cases of distal radius fracture but most of the time, we only look for ulnar styloid fracture and we look for whether there is a dorsal subluxation of DRUJ in distal radius fracture. So, hence further, we must look at carpus very, very, uh, you know, efficiently. That is the comment I would like to make. You are muted, sir. Dr. Gane, you are... Huh. Sir, unmute. For how, how far you will... Uh... Go for a open reduction and primary open reduction and fixation uh, before going to some other procedures uh, in a lunate and perilunate fracture. Uh, so it depends so, on when, if anybody who is coming acute situation, most of the time under anesthesia, regional or general, that's as per the prefer, anesthetist preference. If you just give a good traction, sustained traction for one minute, by principles of simple ligamentotaxis, the lunate sits in. In acute situation, less than four days or a one week. After one week, sometimes up to 10 days or two weeks, we can still attempt a close reduction. But uh, sometimes we have to consider open reduction. 
if the lunate or perilunate dislocation is associated with fractures of scaphoid or capitate there is no option but to go for open reduction and otherwise close reduction and percutaneous spinnings of both proximal and distal carpal row as dr julie explained so that is how we can proceed and in chronic cases as per the status of the cartilage and the profession of the patient we choose the option usually i do not uh, consider any reconstruction or open reduction and internal fixation after 12 weeks of injury i straight away give them option of proximal row carpectomy that means if the if uh, after a week or so if you are attempting for a close reduction we must also take a consent for for open, open reduction. reduction yeah and that should be the dictum of yes. this uh, yes injury yes yeah <clears throat> okay we will go for next yeah okay yeah so <clears throat> I call upon uh, Dr. Vishnu Nair. He will be speaking on ulnar sided wrist pain. Uh, is my uh, screen being shared, sir? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you to the respect. Make it make it full screen. Me. Yeah. Make it full screen. Yes, full screen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just a second. So I will be speaking on uh, the ulna-sided wrist pain. Um, I'm also a senior resident in the Department of Orthopedics in Navi Mumbai. Uh, to start with, we understand the basic anatomy. This is the bony anatomy. We know the bones around there. We want to make sure that we know how the TFCC is attached. We have the palmar distal radial ulnar ligament. Okay, we have the dorsal distal radial ulnar ligament. We also have uh, the ECU along with its tendon sheath. right lateral to the styloid um we have lunate the tricuspid the luno tricuspid ligament uh, which also forms a part of what i'm going to speak about on the ulna sided wrist pain so this is a triangular disc we have better pictures ahead so basically we would uh, we want to get a systematic approach to a diagnosis we don't want to just say there is some kind of pain in the ulna side we want to warrant it and know exactly what it is it's just like the low back pain of hand um just a short steroid is probably going to uh give a good uh, result for a short time but it would be better to get a diagnosis so what do we have there we have a bone we have joints uh we have a ligament arteries and nerves which could cause problems now this is a comprehensive diagram trying to make us understand how the attachments from the ulna styloid to all the, the three bones the lunate tricuspid and the capitate so those three ligaments that is ut uc and ul okay and we have the dorsal radio ulna ligament and we also have the palmar radio ulna ligament which uh, help in stabilizing the distal radio ulna joint so the triangular fiber cartilage as we all know has seven uh, parts of the ulna collateral ligament uh, the ulna tricuspid ligament ulna lunate the palmar radio ulna ligament triangle of tfcc proper a uh, dorsal radio ulna ligament and the extensor carpal ulnaris tendon sheath which is lateral again just a diagram trying to show the recesses we have a pre styloid recess here right at the ulna styloid we have an ulna styloid recess this is the triangular disc the disc proper of the tfcc and you can see the ecu tendon going right next to the styloid so so to classify this is to know how to treat it so once we classify it uh, we have two types of tears we'll classify it into a traumatic and a degenerative tear a traumatic tear can have a central perforation okay it can have a central perforation which is avascular which is usually not repaired because a repair would not give a good result then we have an avulsion from the ulnar side in the type c we have a distal avulsion more distally towards the carpal joints then we have a distal avulsion and the radial side avulsion now a degenerative tear would warrant us to also talk about arthritis so how that grades is the last type that grade e that would have along with ulnocarpal arthritis and the same tears this is an arterial supply i think we'll move ahead uh, so if we want to classify the type 1 tear 
Now there are types of tears. You can see there's a radial tear in A, class 1A. You can see there's an ulnar sided tear on B, a volar tear. And this volar tear is also with a DRUJ instability. And this is along the margin of the distal radius, attachment on the distal radius. That's type 1D. Now an acute tear, as we said, a central or a radial tear would have no instability. A problem comes to us when we have instability. Now that happens when there is a distal radio ulnar joint disruption, or we have any chronic tear or a, a, a more of a horizontal tear. Now the peripheral tears are going to give us more instability than a central or a radial tear. This is a type two palmar, like we discussed, degenerative tears. You can see that in the first image, we can see thinning of the TFCC. And in the second one, that is 2B, we have chondromalacia, right? And subchondral cysts in the lunate. Of course, we usually splint it for six weeks. That is our usual management. Uh, in supination is the uh, most preferred choice because in supination, it, there is way less dorsal subluxation of the distal radio and joint. Now, if we don't have relief even after six weeks, uh, then we go for an open reduction and pinning of the distal radio ulna joint, considering that along with the TFCC tear, there is a distal radio ulna joint disruption. Now, when should we interfere early? If there is an acute on chronic tear, okay, along with wrist pain, and it's very easily clinically seen that there is a distal radio ulna joint instability, of course, we have to intervene, and an ulna variance of more than two millimeters. We have many options. We can go for a debridement in some types. Uh, we can uh, do a repair. Uh, a, a foveal tear can uh, warrant a repair. Uh, we can do an arthroscopic TFCC repair, which is now gold standard, which is shown to prove that it's the best, gives the best outcomes. The study showing conservative management of uh, TFCC tears, which was a very good positive outcome. A patient wore a brace for more than 12 weeks after failing conservative management as an alternative surgery, and the results were very good in uh, long-term follow-up. Now, this is an article showing chronic tears. 57 patients were undergone uh, surgery, okay, for a, a tear which was more than, which had pain for more than nine months. And prior to surgery and post-surgery, the satisfaction rate was 98%. So chronic tears do chronic tears with pain or DREJ disruption do warrant surgical management. Uh, the next topic we'll talk about al on ulnar sided radio, uh, uh, ulnar sided pain is distal radio ulnar joint disruption. TFCC is one of the main parts of uh, the distal radio ulnar joint. Now, uh, what is the mechanism of injury? It's a fall on the hand backward, uh, hand in front, hand by side. You can see how, how our forearm rotates when it's pronated, right? something for simple understanding and uh, that fall that pronation injury can cause a DRUG or a TFCC tear. clinically you want to look for ulnar sided pain you want to look for any stiffness if there was a fracture before any clicking sounds any obvious instability so you mentally project all the bones this is the most important thing I think uh, you want to mentally project all the bones right on the dorsal side where you want to examine the DRUJ and the TFCC and you palpate. What else can we do? We can assess in a pronated hand. We can look for belotment of the radius. We also can do a press off test. So you ask the patient to uh, put pressure on the table and try to get up, right? So he will reproduce symptoms of pain, which he has usually. Uh, a piano key test, this is, I think, common and everyone knows about this. We keep the hand in pronation. We want to uh, make sure that the dorsal subluxation is obvious. Then you want to give a counter track counter on the, to elevate the pisiform and depress the ulnar head below. And you can obviously see that it reduce, reduces. This is a piano key test, again, for distal radial ulnar joint. So what produces pain, right, on the distal radial ulnar joint? It could be an impaction after any fracture could be incongruity due to chronic tears or uh, something like an arthritis. 
inflammatory conditions like RF, and it could be due to any obvious instability. So we get a patient uh, and you want to do an X-ray. What do you exactly look for? Of course, you take an AP and a lateral. You can do a clenched fist um, lateral too. You can see here in lateral, there is a dorsal subluxation, right, of the ulna styloid. And there is a way, there's an obvious distal radio ulnar joint disruption. Just for us to know the normal, neutral, negative and positive ulnar variants. So what are the types of instability that we know? We know acute and chronic. Now, why would there be a chronic instability? It could be uh, something systematic, uh, systemic like a rheumatoid. It could be combined. It could be a styloid process fracture, which is you know ignored or not treated, or a malunited distal radius fracture. Malunited distal radius fracture, most common complication is a distal radial ulnar joint instability. So uh, we could treat this conservatively um, if there is no obvious um, pain or chronic pain, persistent pain. That's when we go for a TFCC repair, right? And the repair of a TFCC is warranted only when it is in a peripheral part because that is vascular and that is what uh, is expected to heal. So this is a procedure called ADAMS. Uh, it is basically a procedure in which you use the PAMR's longest graft and you reconstruct the distal radial ulnar joint. Of course, distal radial ulnar joints could be with fractures, right? We see a distal and radius uh, X-ray every time, an AP and lateral. Now, how do we know if uh, there is a DRE? So you want to look for shortening of the radius more than five millimeters, a base of ulnar styloid fracture, something like this. Okay, you want to look for that fracture, um, a widening of the DREG interval on a PA view, and a dislocation of the DREG and lateral. What other causes could uh, give you ulnar styloid, ulnar sided wrist pain? It could be an ulnar styloid fracture. Of course, we have the ulna nerve. It could be compressed. Patients often, so you want to rule out any ulna nerve pathology. You want to look for a positive tunnel sign over the Guyens canal. You want to look for paresthesias in the small and ring fingers, sensory supply. As we know, this is the sensory supply of the ulna nerve. What you want to look for to rule out any nerve pathology. Uh, then comes ulna artery thrombosis. Of course, this is somewhere we. We, something we want to rule out. So you always do an Allen's, a modified Allen's test. Uh, you want to compress both the ulnar artery and the radial artery uh, for about 30 seconds. And uh, you want to them to clench their fist. So you want to, uh, you know, as soon as they unclench it, the palm should blanch. And if it doesn't, you are applying, you aren't enough, pressure isn't being applied. So you want to completely make sure that you press both the ulnar and the radial. And a negative test would be as soon as you release the artery, the pressure of the ulna artery, the hand flushes within five seconds. We all know what an Allen's test is. What are the causes? So we spoke about DRUJ, we spoke about TFCC rupture, we spoke about ulnar base, ulnar styloid base fractures. Others are Keenbox disease, as explained by Zuili before, uh, that could also cause ulnar static pain, ulnar impaction, and arthritis and ECU stenosing synovitis. I would uh, uh, just like to uh, share some cases. Um, you can see here it's an 18 year old female with a history of trauma to the wrist, uh, history of fall on an outstretched hand. Uh, the patient also had a high beaten score uh, for laxity. Laxity, sorry. And uh, I hope you can see the video. Is it being played? No, we cannot see. Yeah, I think now, 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 yeah. So intraoperative uh, imaging, I mean, uh, this is an intraoperative video showing this patient's uh, subluxation of the dorsal radial ulnar joint. Just a second. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, I hope you can visualize that. Yeah. How the ulnar styloid is uh, subluxating dorsally. So we went in ahead and uh, did a repair. And uh, this is a post-op video of the same patient. Looks well and stable. Um, second case of 32-year-old male, history of fall, again, uh, with ulna-sided wrist pain since three months. 
So uh, we did an MRI. The MRI on the right side is just for us to correlate anatomically. So uh, you can see there's a tear right at the ulna fovea. So that is a triangular ligament proper tear, right? So you want to reattach that for stability. So uh, this is an approach between the fourth and the fifth compartment. Uh, so we uh, went to the skin, uh, the subcutaneous tissue. Uh, here you can see that we are uh, going to incise the capsule. And there is the incision on, and the first image on top is where you we incise the capsule. After uh, we take the extensor retinaculum away from it, and we leave some on the radial side so we can suture it back. And then we can expose the distal ulna or the styloid and repair it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dyer. Um, if you are done, can you stop? Uh, yeah, yes, screen? yes. And I invite any comments and discussion regarding unnecessary risk pain. Thank you. So my first comment is whenever you see a lax laxity in an injured wrist, always yes, make a habit of comparing that laxity with, with the opposite, opposite side. side. Yes, okay. Yes, sir. Opposite wrist. Yes, sir. Because many times, some many patients will have common laxity. Right. Many patients who are thin, skinny patients, they will always have a dorsal subluxation of ulna, non-pathological. Okay. Then second thing is only restriction of pronosupination and flexion extension does not uh, warrant any surgical indication for ulnar-sided wrist pain. Do not mm -hmm. depend on too much of MRI for ulnar-sided wrist pain. There is something called dark throwing motion of the wrist, you know, this motion of the wrist, dark throwing motion. So if patient has too much of pain on this movement, to put a load on the wrist and get X-ray. Yeah, that, that then piano key sign positive, frank laxity. These are the signs where we can consider a proper tear okay. and then correlate with the MRI. Nowadays, uh, Dr. Abhijit may agree with me that nowadays I, I have a patient that sometime, I mean, all orthopedic and we are very good reading at spine MRIs, very good. But wrist MRI needs a dedicated wrist coil. And I mean, three Tesla MRI machine only can pick up, you know, they take cuts at 0.5 millimeter at 1.5 Tesla machine, if the MRI machine does not have a dedicated wrist coil or a finger coil, then sometime we may miss some of the injuries like a ganglion cyst somewhere or sometime. So I give the option to the patient that or some Sir, not audible, sir. A diagnostic arthroscopy and followed by, yeah, a diagnostic arthroscopy and followed by, you know, diagnostic arthroscopy followed by a therapeutic procedure. Okay. So, otherwise, ulnar sided wrist pain, mainly they come with tendonitis, either extensor carpi tendonitis or a flexor carpi tendonitis. And we should not miss about thickening of ECU sheath, sub sheath. It is like, you know, decur one's disease on the radial side. Sometimes the issue sheath is also very much thickened. And if you release the sheath, the pain completely goes away. Before release sheath or before offering a, a surgery for that, just give hydrocord with lignocaine injection and see if, your, if the patient's pain completely goes away. Then only you offer the release of ECU sheath. These are the two, three points about ulnar sided pain. Yeah, thank you. Vishnu, a wonderful presentation. Sometimes we come across everything is normal. Still, the patient gets a very non specific trigger type of pain at the ulnar level. And in such a situation, if you do analgesic rest and when you try, nothing comes out. 
But in that case, sometimes the hydrocortisone do help. So do yeah. we advocate such type of a treatment in such a chronic, non-specific uh, uh, trigger point pains? So I I have personally not uh, given a hydrocort injection yet on the Alna side. I mean I have never come across a patient uh, something like Sir said of ECU or an FCU um, tendonitis. So I'm not sure, sir. Uh, yes, Abhijit. Um, a couple of things. Uh, I'll just first begin with um, a continuum of what Parag was left referring to a moment ago and in tandem with Dr. Naya's talk. I think it is of fundamental importance for all of us to understand that we being the clinicians uh, should first and foremost be very sure of our clinical diagnosis and uh, the differential diagnosis um, relying on a very thorough clinical examination and eliciting the history. The radiology should not be a eureka moment for us. Um, I think radiology, the MRI, CT scan, X-rays, whatever it is that we do, sonography at times, should only be a corroboration of what we already know clinically. Now, we also should understand that our radiologist colleagues have not examined the patient, um, and the MRI also is often done by the technicians, whereas the radiologist will just see the report, and, I mean, the images and report on it. So it is, I think... Uh, incumbent upon us to pick up the phone, talk to the radiologist colleague and tell them that this patient is coming your way and this is what I think, or at least write a note in detail, um, you know, appraising them of what you think is a clinical diagnosis and so that the radiology also corroborates and they are able to, you know, kind of look for the problem that you are searching. So please make that a habit. Second thing that... Uh, Dr. Gadi sir was alluding to about these uh, cohort, this cohort of patients who have some kind of pain. Yes, I think a local steroid injection does work very well. However, on the other side, we have to be very careful when we are injecting because we don't want to inject in a tendon because that may cause a rupture. The joint space is pretty tight, so you need to be very careful about injecting the steroid and you have to forewarn your patient about the steroid-induced lipodystrophy that can cause uh, hypopigmentation or depigmentation of the skin. That should not come as a surprise to the patient. And then I usually, uh, you know, kind of restrict uh, the steroid injection to about a maximum of two, spacing them out quite well so that, uh, you know, uh, we have not uh, burned any bridges behind us or caused any problems because of the injection itself. And then more often than not, if um, some of you would take up hand surgery and wrist surgery as a career option and train yourself in wrist arthroscopy, I think uh, you will perhaps then realize that there is almost always a reason why the pain is present and is not going away. It may be simple things like capsular tears, which may not be picked up on the MRI. A TFCC tear that is chronic, and again, the MRI may not be very, uh, you know, contributed to the diagnosis. So, Again, clinical diagnosis, uh, your uh, history, um, your treatment that has to be you know, individualized to the patient. And again, if you do utilize arthroscopy, I think that will add that edge uh, in improving your patient care. Thank you so much. So wonderful discussion. We should go more again. Mm -hmm. Next case. Ashok, there are wonderful uh, presenters uh, and a very good case. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, so sir. basically, it was uh, it, like we have started a young surgeon forum. So we are like these are all uh, just one year back. They have passed out and then they are presenting. So uh, kudos to them. <laughs> we'll History. give you next chance again in the month of June, July. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank you so much. Sir, I am Dr. Salgotra. Can I make a comment, please? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, first of all, sir, I am I'm, I'm the hospital director of MGM Medical College Hospital. Uh, I have a very pleasant duty to uh, compliment three of my uh, senior residents, uh, Dr. Manan Shah, Dr. Duli Mahatre, and Dr. Vishnu Naya. Uh, under the able guidance of Dr. Ashok Bhodke, they have made beautiful presentations. 
I heard the presentations very keenly, very attentively. Uh, specialized hand topics, and under the expert uh, uh, guidance of Dr. Prag, Dr. Uh, Vasu, Dr. Abhijit. Uh, in fact, I compliment all the speakers, and also compliment Dr. Ashok Ghodke having prepared the essay so very well. And uh, I personally learned a lot uh, from the expert comments given by Dr. Prag, Dr. Vasu, Dr. Abhijit. And all in all, I've been hearing them very keenly. Uh, wonderful presentations and compliment to the Young uh, Surgeons Forum, who, who is giving uh, opportunity to the young surgeons to present themselves and uh, express themselves. Uh, wonderful occasion for them. And I thank Dr. Ashok Ghorke and all the experts. Uh, thank you so much. I don't have questions, but I, had, I thought I'll compliment the young surgeons on making a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Please continue. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Dr. Ghorke, would you like to please invite the speaker? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, with next presentation. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I invite Dr. Gaurav Sharma. He will be talking about on uh, the most liked topic by everyone and most controversial still, uh, distal and radius. Gaurav. Hello, am I audible? Yeah. Hello. Go ahead. And uh, you uh, do yeah. full screen. Yeah, right, right. Thank you. Yeah, so good evening, everybody. I'm Gaurav, and uh, my controversial topic for today is distal and radius fracture. Uh, now, the outline of this particular talk, in the next 20 minutes, I'm not going to talk about the anatomy and the exam or the examination of distal and radius. I'm not here to, uh, for that. Um, I'll be presenting the, uh, I'll be discussing about the present evidence for treating these fractures and few interesting cases. All right, so an introduction. Today, the literature is burgeoning with data often contradictory for the most commonest type of fracture which is seen, uh, that's a distal and radius fracture. Yeah, so the goal of treatment for treating these and treating these fractures is first to obtain sufficient pain-free motion, early return to activities of daily living and minimizing the risk for future degenerative changes or disability. Now, what do we have in our armamentarium? Now, it could be immobilization without reduction. It could be immobilization with reduction, percutaneous spinning, spanning external fixator, non-spanning external fixator, distraction plate, polar plate, dorsal plate, fragment specific fixation, intermediary nail or most recently used things uh, which is arthroscopic assisted uh, fixation techniques yeah so in order to simplify the dictators of treatment could be divided into patient factors it could be fracture factors uh, or it could be surgeon related factors now starting from the patient factors it uh, the treatment modality could be decided uh, decided based upon the age mechanism of injury occupation hand dominance of the patient patient preference uh, many of the times we come across our patients who are like a uh, XYZ uh, relative of mine or friend of mine was treated by a particular modality for, the sim for a similar kind of fracture. So I would like to prefer that or is it better than the other or I would like to go for conservative line of management, which is again very common in our country. Now patient expectations. Now the most commonest uh, thing or the most commonest question which everybody asks or almost every of our patient asks is, is ki kya guarantee hai? This particular treatment, is ki kya guarantee hai? Surgery, kya guarantee hai? Conservative, kya guarantee hai? So this is something which one needs to consider and think about. Now the fracture geometry, fracture geometry could be whether the fracture is intra or extra articular, uh, the number of columns involved or concomitant injuries. Now, the radiological parameters which are very important are the bowler tilt or the palmar tilt, radial inclination, radial height, and ulna variance. Now, the surgeon-related factors could be something like old is gold. I have been treated, I've been treating these particular fractures in a particular XYZ way, and I, in my vast majority of experience, this is the way that it should be treated. 
Uh, now, there was an interesting paper by Chung and Koalittle and who found that young surgeons, female surgeons and fellowship trained orthopedic surgeons, uh, fellowship trained hand surgeons are more in favor of operative intervention as compared to conservative line of management for distal and radius fractures. So the big question here is whether to operate or to conserve. Now, we need some solid evidence here. Now, what could be the better evidence than a level one meta-analysis? Now, the first question here is conserve, whether to conserve or operate. Now, this is a meta-analysis which, uh, which was published in way back in 2016, which says, uh, comparing the conservative versus, uh, versus operative line of management, which says that there are very few clinical differences between the results of internal fixation and conservative treatment for dis displaced distal and radius fracture, and the best course of treatment must be determined based on the concrete conditions. Another meta-analysis way back in 2015, which was done specifically on elderly. Now, the word elderly here defines patients above the age of 65. So they came up with, uh, with a conclusion that there are similar results in treatment of distal and radius fractures in elderly. In, whereas in adults, that is less than 65 years of age, this was another recent meta-analysis uh, which stated that the surgical treatment can ensure better clinical and radiological results for the treatment of distal and radius fractures in adults with similar complication rates. Now, another recent meta-analysis which states that uh, the operative treatment for distal and radius fracture improves the mid-term mid -term dash and grip strength compared to non-operative treatment. However, the operative treatment might, uh, and moreover, the operative treatment might be more effective and have a greater effect on health and well-being of younger non-elderly patients. Now, uh, we know that the, the recently the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeon Board of Directors, they've proposed that indications for fixation in non-geriatric patients that is less than 65 years of age, there is a moderate evidence which suggests that the operative treatment for fractures with post-reduction Radial shortening of greater than 3 mm, dorsal tilt of greater than 10, mm, 10 degrees, and intraarticular displacement or step off of greater than 2 mm leads to improved radiological and patient reported outcomes. So, again, there is a moderate evidence for non geriatric patients that is less than 65 years of age, whereas there is a strong evidence suggesting that the operative intervention does not lead to improved long term patient reported outcomes as compared to non operative treatment for geriatric patients. Now, the second question here is whether a volar plate uh, or, a, or just k wires. Now, again, meta-analysis by uh, Dr. Mohit Bhandari, uh, he say, uh, which was way back in 2015 in CORR, and they found that the volar locking plates, although they show better dash scores at 3 and 12 months follow-up compared with k wires for, uh, for displaced fractures, however, these differences were very small and unlikely to be clinically important. Now, another study way back in 2015, which states that there is no clear evidence of superiority of either fixation method between the volar plating or the KVAS. Now, next is volar plate versus external fixator. Now, what evidence says is that this was a meta-analysis which was published recently in 2021. And they stated that there is no significant difference in radiological outcomes uh, in volar versus external fixator. Whereas the volar locking plate has lower dash scores and VAS score, but with lower grip strength. So again, the last question is whether a volar plate or a dorsal plate. Again, a meta-analysis, uh, a study which was done to compare the compl uh, which plate would be superior. They stated that there is no uh, preferred plate fixation technique on based on the uh, present literature. And the decision for the type of plate fixation should be based on the fracture type and the surgeon's experience with specific approach and plate types. Now, in order to summarize, what we have is these four questions. First, we know that majority of the level one studies today states that surgery should be the preferred modality of treatment in younger, less than 65 years of age with dominant hand and with a high demand patient in high demand patients, whereas casting could be preferred or given an option in elderly patients in geriatric group with low demand. For in between volar plates and K versus K wires, yes, the definite uh, there is a uh, evidence which says that the volar plating is superior to K wires. Between volar plates and external fixator, there's no difference as far as unstable fractures are concerned. Between volar plates or dorsal plate, again, it depends upon the surgeon preference, but you cannot certainly compare apple with oranges here. So it should always be according to the fracture fragments, whether the fracture fragment is more dorsal or more volar, which should dictate the treatment modality. Now, 
the important parameters which should be considered, which should be restored, the radiological parameters, there are three most important radiological parameters which the evidence suggests. First is the radial height, the volar tilt, and the radial inclination. These three parameters are of utmost importance when deciding or when treating distal and radius fractures. Now coming to interesting cases, case one, uh, this is a 25 year old right hand dominant male gentleman with the uh, dominant side involved. He had a head, head injury as well. Uh, now the CT scan was done because the x-ray was not proper and there was some, uh, some question regarding, some doubt regarding the intra-articular extension of the fragment. So as you can see here, there is a depressed articular piece with distal radial joint uh, congruity which is, uh, which is affected. Now there is also severe dorsal comminution which is present. Now the coronal images here, you can see that the radial shaft has wedged between the lunate and the stylet fragment and there is severe posterior comminution. Now the volar lunate fragment has turned upside down, which can be appreciated well here. Now these are the 3D CT scan images of the same patient. You can see the dorsal comminution and the volar lunate fragment. Now, a uh, flexor carpi radialis approach modified was, uh, was used here and the, uh, the volar lunate fragment was, turned, was seen in 90 degrees rotate, rotation and which was turned, we de-rotated uh, using the joystick and you, you can see the interoperative images. Now, the rotated articular fragment has been reduced well. Again, it can be appreciated here. Now, there is no, no, the, the whole purpose of discussing this particular case was that there has been an interesting paper which suggests that in order to improve DRUJ stability, there is something called as DOB. Now, what is a DOB? DOB is the distal oblique band of distal interosseous membrane. Now, what happens is that there is some radial translation which is happening in the uh, in the distal and radius fracture which needs to be corrected. I'll, I'll explain in, uh, in coming slides what I'm saying. Now, what is a DOB of DIOM? Now, the definition states that the DOB originates from approximately distal one-sixth area of the ulna shaft, approximately coinciding with the proximal border of the pronator quadratus muscle and runs distally towards the distal radio ulna joint. And it is an important factor in maintaining the DRUJ stability. Now, this is the paper which was by Angelus et al., which shows the presence of the distal oblique bundle. Now, uh, coming back to that particular case, now the temporary stabilization with KYS was done, as you can see here. And the lift off technique or the push through technique, which, which is very commonly used in order to, uh, in, uh, to achieve a proper correction of the volar tilt in distal and radius fracture was applied here. Uh, as you can see, there is a spacer between the proximal fragment and the LCP. Now, as an alternative to the uh, to this, what can be done is a, a locking screw of maybe around 10 or 12 millimeters in length can be used uh, in the distal most screw and the plate could be lifted off from the distal end. And first, the distal most screws should be inserted and from, I'm sorry, from the proximal end and the distal most screws should be inserted and then the uh, locking screw should be removed. And once we insert the screw in the proximal fragment, there is automatically some correction of the volar tilt, which can be achieved interoperatively. So that's what was done in this particular case here. You can see the interoperative images. Now, this was the final picture and a follow-up of the same patient, and he's doing well. Now, why suddenly all this? Where does this particular DOB comes from? Now, the DOB of DIOM is basically primarily responsible for DRUJ stability and one should always try to restore the distal radial translation which is usually neglected. Now what does this mean? This is what we mean by the distal radial, uh, distal, distal radial translation. As you can see the x-ray on your left, there is distal radial uh, translation which can be corrected. Now, once you correct this particular thing, it, it is hypothesized that uh, there is some amount of distal radial ulna joint stability which is achieved. So one should always think of radial translation, correcting the radial translation. Now coming to case two, 77 year old gentleman, dominant hand, active, fall on outstretched hand. These are the images of day one treated conservatively and three weeks. Now, you can see that there is a central repletion, radial shortening, severe metaphysical combination. Now, again, uh, FCR approach was used. 
and the distal fragment was too small. So in order to address these particular fragments, the rim plate uh, gives a good buttressing effect in these kind of fractures, in these type of fractures. And uh, as you can see in, these, uh, in the X-ray uh, towards your extreme right, the uh, rim plate has been applied and the middle column has been fixed. But what about the radial column? Now here comes the role of specific uh, or the, or the plate, uh, column specific plates. Now, as you can see here, the post-operative images of the, the radial column has been stored. And these are the post-operative and the follow-up images of the same patient, clinical and radiographic. Now, K3, Kapanji technique, again, which is very, very commonly done. And it is an effective technique in treating the distal and radius fractures. Now, the prerequisites are the folded sheets, which can which should be kept under the wrist, 0.5 mm transverse incision, first at the radial stylite, then at the central column, and third in the ulnar column of the wrist. Separate the tendons and superficial radial nerve, that is of utmost importance to avoid injury. Now, this is a schematic representation which says that to the extreme left, you would see that the K wire, uh, mind it, it should uh, prefer a diamond tipped K wire because there is a less chance of back out. So the first slide, uh, you can see that the K wire is passing 90 degrees to the fracture. And second slide, you can see the K wire, one, one from the 90 degree angle and one from the 45 degree angle. I'll explain them uh, in, in my coming slides as well. And uh, that is how the uh, radial displacement and the volar or dorsal displacement is treated. Now, these are the clinical images you can see from left to right, from up and down. Now, the post-operative uh, protocol remains the same. Above will go slap, full supination for three weeks, physio with intermittent copper splint for one week, and remove the KVAS and the local anesthesia after four weeks. Now, these are a few interesting cases which were operated using the Kapenji technique. Again, this one. I wanted to show you some video. Yeah, so as you can see, uh, the first wire is passed from the radial stylite fragment, just distal to it, and a continuation of that would be this. I'm sorry, the same video. Yeah, so this is the second video, which shows the manipulation of the fractured fragment in order to correct the bowler and the total tilt. This is interoperative image showing the stability of the Kapanji technique. Yes. Yeah, all right. So case four, this is an intra and distal and radius fracture, could see Dr. DDT. So uh, this particular fracture, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not aware of the demographic details of this particular patient because surgeon had it when he shared the case. And uh, so K wiring was done. So this is a perfect example of K wire disaster. As you can see, immediate post-operative image, uh, the wires are crossing distal to the fracture site, which again is not acceptable. So eventually it had to fail. It is so-called day one failure in uh, many people's language. So as you can see, after two months, there was a late collapse which occurred here. So what was done for this? This is four months follow-up. Again, this was the second surgery which was done by a very well-renowned surgeon. And this particular uh, fixed angle plate was used along with iliac crest graft to treat the malunion. Unfortunately, this is the three month, uh, uh, two month post-op after the second surgery. Eventually it failed and there was an implant failure at five months. So in such kind of cases, maybe a salvage procedure like Sokopanji procedure is the way to go. So the whole idea to share this particular case was K wire, although effective, but should be done adequately and uh, correctly. So we have the last case, which was a medico, uh, 64 year old gentleman, low velocity injury, fall on outstretched hand, presented uh, presented after surgery, which was done elsewhere, just for a second opinion. So this was his immediate post-operative x-ray, which was done, an external fixator along with K wires was up, uh, were, were used. And as you can see, the K wires are crossing uh, proximal to the fracture site here, and everything seemed to be good. 
and this was after removal of the fixator you can see in the lateral view there are some changes after two months the fracture started to collapse at five months this was the i'm sorry but uh, i don't have the uh, the the further x-ray uh, further x-rays and images and the clinical pictures of this particular patient but definitely there was a locking plate fixation which was done and uh, the patient is doing well the whole idea of showing this particular x-ray was to uh, was to show you that uh, the external fixator and a very well done uh, a good done external fixator and kvi can also fail now kvi still work if done correctly all right thank you thank you dr sharva can you stop sharing your screen please and yes. we may have the yes. discussion and any questions regarding this talk thank you so dr sharma what would you offer a patient with you know colitis fracture in a 50 year old surgeon what will be your treatment uh, so as i said uh, i'll discuss with the patient and his requirements his uh, his uh, his his i mean what what all expectations does he has and uh, full range of movement i want <laughs> that will be the he is a surgeon 50 year old right hand dominant colitis fracture If in my fifties I would have a a, a, a colitis fracture, I would prefer a plating. I would get a plating for me at least. Good. So again, a concept of dart throwing motion. Please okay. go through all of us. I mean, must know about this concept. It is not only flexion, extension, and pronosupination. It is a dart throwing motion, which is this motion is a function of the wrist. Is this okay? And this will be achieved mainly after. you know achieving all parameters radiological parameters of uh, fracture with whatever modality of treatment you choose and in my experience if you do not operate any distal radius fracture it is 100% going to collapse and patient you cannot do surya namaskar pull ups push ups you know they can just show this but this is we are, i am not interested in this i just will ask the patient can you you do go back to your previous profession you know and yes complications rates of surgeries are high but then for that they have to be trained to use which proper implant they have to be trained for a proper exposure they have to be trained to you know see intraop like you showed a fantastic case where the plate was put the proximal shaft was still placed on the ulnar side and then you have to so if you don't operate well those patients are going to cause problem and that we can't count as a you know surgical that surgical disaster we can't count as a loss of function after surgery so i practically operate every distal radius if they come to me below below 60 and if they tell me you uh, please give a plaster i i don't give plaster i tell them i send them one of my very senior friend dr mohan patra who has excellent technique and excellent follow up excellent result but he has mastered it you know and very very good technique very good technique i am not trained <laughs> to give plaster and for that he does close reduction for even a ulnar marten fracture also yeah yeah and, uh, and it's a technique that he shares with me number of times Yes, sir. and uh, probably he gets the best <coughs> result because of its uh, accurate uh, reduction and maintenance and Will above elbow reduction. cast above elbow cast for uh -huh. you know his protocol is 42 days above elbow cast you uh -huh. will not be you will not believe last one month i have done twice for colitis fracture his uh -huh. technique in 3 months back and first time in last 10 years i got good result you know my x rays are looking good my patients are otherwise my patients are not happy with my close reduction technique that's why i offer them a surgery as option yes doctor can i yeah yeah doctor good yeah so one of the most frustrating complications what we come across even if we do a plaster or if we, if we do we do operate so that is that rsd and i have heard dr parag talking a lot about that can you just yeah. give some tips how to prevent this rsd because this is really frustrating for the surgeon yeah. for the surgeon as well as the patient and relatives 
so there are two concepts in rsd first of all there are believers there is a surgeon in barcelona spain dr del paco pinal he believes that there is no term called reflex sympathetic dystrophy exist in the world okay and it is the man made disaster either by the patient or by the surgeon so now to answer your question first of all how to prevent this whenever you are going giving any plaster of distal end radius make sure that your plaster distal end is not crossing the distal palmar crease that is one point once you give the plaster make sure that patient is able to do 90 degree of metacarpophalangeal joint flexion 90 degree if he is not able to do it you please recess cut the plaster little proximal then make sure that the thumb is completely free out of the plaster in distal radius and second is do not tell the patient you know to do only this you have to tell the patient to do this statue of lip because they they keep the hand like this we are we threaten them that if you keep the hand down the plaster will become tight you will have lot of swelling so the exercise should start from shoulder to fingertip not only in the hand that is third point number four point is i am not very fond of you know that pouch arm sling or uh, you know bandage sling i don't give it to the my patient because if you give them pouch arm sling usually the patients wear the sling like this you know below the heart level the pouch arm sling also the patient should keep the hand on the opposite shoulder this is how you should that actually follow the elevation and you must warn them to you know remove the sling intermittently and keep moving so these are all the precautions and about the medical management i if patient gets reflex sympathetic dystrophy it is my humble request to all orthopedic surgeon do not refer them to physiotherapist it is your child you have made it or your patient has done it so they otherwise physiotherapists they go aggressively they go sometime too gentle or too slow and that patient is our baby we have to manage it because many times i have seen they just refer them to therapist therapists refer them back to surgeon and they keep coming with the swollen hand so good anti inflammatory i am not uh, uh, promoting any name of any drugs but my drug of choice is five drugs i start for complex regional pain syndrome is cox2 inhibitor the brand etericoxib once in a day ultracid i mean tramadol paracetamol combination twice a day vitamin c two tablets six time i mean three times in a day then i mean uh, dispersime or this thing because we have to reduce swelling we have to reduce pain then only they will be able to do exercise and all these medications i continue for three weeks three weeks and then after that up uh, 3 weeks the pain settles down then i call them in my consulting room i usually run crps clinics where you know only crps people come once in a month and i give 15 minutes per patient and i do mobilization of individual joint for 15 minutes that is the you know that is how i teach them and you will not be surprised it's a very simple treatment and the third thing that i want to mention about crps about the paco pinal from barcelona he has a paper that if you just do google search does crps exist his paper comes first he believes that all crps patient should undergo carpal tunnel release and he has shown fantastic result fantastic results okay so read that paper once and then take a personal call whether our patient is going to benefit with that operation or not but his uh, excellent paper and we have invited him many times in hand surgery forum and he has tried to convince us that you know doing the carpal tunnel release for crps patient helps but i am not promoting his idea also it is completely selection of the patient by the surgeon that is the that is how you should decide i hope yeah, i have thank you. clarified nice something. nice yeah. it was very nice uh, uh, explanation i would like to ask dr abhijit uh, any any medications you give so that uh, uh, to prevent crpf and so, what about like like he said the the injury should be at or above heart level and what what should we do in an above elevation, elbow cast elevation not yeah, injury yeah. but what ah. what do you do in above elbow cast so above, above elbow, elbow cast, cast so there is no question of elevation in above elbow cast okay but then in you must explain them when they are awake they keep moving the fingers but in first one week of application of cast in a simple word just explain them 
do not sleep on the opposite side i mean of the cast like if i have a plaster on my left hand if i sleep sleep on the right side my hand will go down and i will have more swelling so i tell them try to sleep on the same side in which the cast is given so if i sleep like this then the chances of you know swelling going down is less otherwise rest of the protocol is same so you can very much give elevation even in an above elbow slab or cast just move the shoulder basically yeah and you i think a very simplistic manner of telling the patient is to keep the hand above heart level or the opposite shoulder level whether you use the sling or not but at the same time you have to ask the patient to keep on moving the shoulder as well so i ask the patient to kind of do the physiotherapy mm. in a manner where shoulder stiffness is also avoided otherwise keeping the hand in this manner will also cause shoulder stiffness now pretty much of the medication that parag described is uh, what i also subscribe to uh, i don't use too much of analgesics however i like to add a gabapentin and b12 combination and then uh, my patients go to a uh, we have i'm very fortunate to be working with a hand therapist who is a fantastic hand therapist so i don't have to devote my time for the therapy part of it my therapist takes care of it and i think it is a fundamental importance that uh, to understand that therapy plays a very important role in um, in the management of crps there is no consensus and there is no evidence of any one particular modality working now uh, what parag was referring to about pacopinial's concept is that uh, he believes that it's just not carpal tunnel syndrome if you have operated upon a patient there may be a nerve injury that may be the trigger for the crps so we need to rule that out we need to also identify any proximal compression like a thoracic outlet perhaps or even cubital tunnel syndrome or a carpal tunnel syndrome as a trigger for crps so it is a challenge for all of us i'm sure all of us have seen these cases they are not easy to manage they need time like parag mentioned you really need to spend time with these patients you need to be a patient listener i think that works wonders for your patients when you earn their faith and trust and they believe that they have been able to pour their heart on and they need reassurance so a lot of reassurance and i think also very important to understand is a multi modality or a team effort in managing these patients so do not hesitate to bring in a pain management specialist do not hesitate to bring in uh, you know your physiotherapist i don't think we alone can manage them effectively sometimes they also need some psychological counseling so keep all the options open do not be dogmatic about uh, the treatment part of it so that's my take on crps and just very quickly if i have the permission of uh, the chair uh, about the distal radius fractures that uh, dr sharma was alluding to i think uh, uh, we all know from the aos statement on distal radius fractures there is very little evidence about uh, the most hello uh, yep yeah. hello no sorry. dr abhijit please continue yeah yes sorry so i think there is very little evidence in um, determining what the best management of our patients is there is very little level one evidence i think the most important determinant of treatment for patients with distal radius fractures is the surgeon himself like we just had this discussion uh, dr mohapatra who is uh, parag senior colleague does um, close reduction and casts for even volo barton fractures now there may not be very many takers for this concept because fundamentally these are fractures that require a buttress plating intraarticular fractures also there are people who will do focal pinning intrafocal pinning or maybe k wires and a fixated distractor wherein we know that there may be late collapse and so on and so forth so i think it is a patient uh, it's a surgeon preferences and the surgeon who is a single most important determinant uh, when deciding the treatment for distal radius fractures and i think otherwise the talk was very very succinct very clear and he again covered all important aspects of the uh, the uh, treatment modalities as well as the decision making in distal radius fractures so
Thank you very much, Mansi. So, uh, uh, with the, I would request Dr. Gadegone, sir, uh, that can we take uh, Dr. Parag's, uh, like he will give some technical tips uh, on fracture distal and radius. He can talk on 10 minutes, we can give him. Yes, sir. Is it yes, possible, sir, Parag, uh, to finish within 10 minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Sir. yes, sir. So that this is the last and we will finish at 10 o'clock. Okay. Okay. So as we are now discussing about the distal radius fracture, I would like to present a small technical tips about the distal radius uh, fracture. Is my screen visible and am I audible? No? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So this is the case where, uh, you know, we are seeing a comminuted distal end radius fracture with loss of radial height and, uh, you know, uh, with dorsal tilt. So this patient, you see the radial inclination and height, dorsal tilt, then extra articular, this looks extra articular fracture with positive ulnar variance and the distal radio ulnar joint is intact. So this is how we check, you know, about the radiological parameters. So I am talking about the technique, you know, how we consider a surgery. So we palpate the flexor carpi radially tendon. What I am showing here, is whenever you want to cross the wrist, do not cross the wrist longitudinally. Always go oblique because that does not cause any scar formation. So this is my incision for distal radius fracture. And then how to approach? I approach through flexor carpi ulnar, flexor carpi radialis sheath. So you see a FCR tendon and take incision directly on the tendon and expose the flexor carpi radialis tendon. Okay. If you go through this approach, most of the time, radial artery will not be visible at all. So we are not worried about, you know, and all these operations are always done under tourniquet control and under proper uh, anesthesia. Then once you uh, release the sheath of FCR, then you retract the FCR radially and take, you know, what I am showing now is the palmar cutaneous branch of median nerve, that thin line. It is very near. So always immediately after the sheath release, on the dorsal aspect, you take an incision. The moment you take an incision, the yellow fat will bulge out. That fat will be either a pronator quadratus or either a flexor pollicis longus. If there is a velocity of trauma is large, then the pronator quadratus is completely torn and that bulges out. So this is how you know you expose the uh, you know the bulging fat in the sheath. So now once you do that, we take a weight gauze piece. And you retract flexor pollicis longus tendon to expose pronator quadratus. Okay. So this is how you just, it's a traumatic dissection. So there is no problem, no injury to palmar cutaneous nerve or anything. So this is how now nicely you will be able to see a pronator quadratus. Okay. Ask your assistant to put a retractor. Now the pronator quadratus is visible. Okay. So after releasing a sheet, we identify and then release the, uh, we take the FPL on the radial ulnar side and that exposes our pronator quadratus. Okay. And now there are ways to deal with how to raise pronator quadratus. So you can take some incision on the radial aspect. You can use cautery and, or you can use a simple, uh, what you say, a periosteum elevator. So once you do that, you raise pronator quadratus to expose the fracture side. So this is what now we are raising the pronator quadratus and fracture site is identified. Okay. And once you do that, now it is very easy to reduce the fracture under proper visualization. I am not using the CM yet. So this is the full length of distal radius I have exposed. Okay. So, okay. After this now, okay. yeah. So raise the PQ with periosteal elevator. Okay. And now we will, re we will give traction and manipulate the joint. How do you give traction? Ask your assistant to longitudinally pull the wrist. Okay. And just take the dorsal fragment up to the, you know, at the fracture side, just take a dorsal fragment. This is how, and once you reduce it, ask your assistant to keep the wrist in flexion. So the, uh, you know, the fracture side will be reduced immediately. So it can be done with the blunt periosteal elevator or it can be done with simple traction also. So, okay. So now, once you do that, hold the, uh, hold the radial styloid now by KY. 
okay once you have a dorsal fragment on the surface then hold it in temporary radial styloid cavity so once you do this step now then the next role is only to put a plate okay so let us see okay so this is how you fix the plate now i will go little in detail about the implant placement so once you do this okay this i we have shown and now you see what i am showing here is reduction that dr nayar explained see the ulnar column the fragment is going on the ulnar side i am not achieving a medial cortex continuity so with my one retractor i am asking a assistant to hold the proximal fragment so that the reduction is maintained so this is one way to have accurate reduction by you know uh, uh, achieving the medial cortex in continuity so once you do that then again the rest of the step is fixation with one radial styloid k wire and put a plate so now here how the sequence of the screws should be put so first of all you stabilize the plate with their k wires they have they provide wires for the plate then now you put a cortical screw in the oblong hole and do not tighten it do not tighten that screw then you put third step sequence is distal row locking screws and then now you tighten the cortical screw so that the plate will sit flush on the bone okay and then you finish the remaining screws this should be the sequence of the in 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 uh, i mean the implant this is the post op x ray the next is what is the concept of watershed line okay so you know watershed line means the pronator quadratus inserts at that level okay we should not put the plate beyond that point so let us take this example okay so you see the there is a you know uh, so you see okay so what is watershed line is now this was the that was the pre op x ray and now you see your plate must not cross beyond this point yeah beyond this point okay the lateral view if it crosses the watershed line then there is a problem of flexor tenosynovitis and implant irritation after the watershed concept the another concept is how to fix a volar ulnar fragment that is called tear drop angle okay so tear drop angle means on the volar side so this is the uh, angle that is seen in the black color is the tear drop angle let us see this picture usually the tear drop angle is usually around 45 degree this was the intra articular fracture and where the tear drop angle is almost 60 degree so you have to fix the screws or the plate use the variable angle implant to correct this so this is usually missed so one 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 must be very very careful you know when you put the plate always always consider putting two screws on the ulnar side of the distal radius near the sigmoid notch so that is how you catch the volar ulnar fragment okay so that was the concept of tear drop now the angle has been restored that was the pre op and this was the post op another last so second last concept that i want to give is concept of 22 degree lateral view many times you this is the ap x ray that is fine okay for this is the pre op and this is the post op but lateral x ray sometime we feel that our screws are in the joint or they are not in the joint so how to confirm so this is the lateral x ray but if you just take a 22 degree lateral view just lift the hand little bit and if you take this view the same x ray will show and confirm us that our screws are not in the joint okay so that is the fourth concept that i wanted to explain about 22 degree lateral view now how to avoid a complication if you have heard these are the sums criteria what is the sums criteria grade 1 your plate first of all must you know this is the sums criteria you draw a vertical line first at the volar tip of the distal radius and another line at the shaft of distal radius so your plate has to be in between these two lines if your plate goes beyond the red line you are going to have complications okay so this is the well placed implant now you see this plate this is going little bit behind so these patients i will recommend them that i will keep a close watch for at least 6 months okay so that may cause flexor tendon irritation and you see this plate this plate is far more, more you know that goes more beyond the red line please advise implant removal if your sums criteria grade 2 if you see on the lateral x ray because these are the patients who are not happy with plating and then we came we you know label them as a 
you know, bad result of surgery. So this is how the Soong's criteria has to be followed. Thank you very much. So these are the five concepts I wanted to explain. Thank you, sir. Parag, wonderful, wonderful clarity of this subject huh? so you have muted. in the lower radius uh, is commendable. And uh, they are very useful tips, five tips. Everybody should practice to improve the result. The wonderful webinar, Masukji. Sir, sir, uh, sir uh, ju just a minute. Uh, we have Dr. Alfin, we are our HOD. So just two, two minutes, he will give a vote yeah, of thanks. Yes, no problem. Uh, good, e good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank MOA on behalf of my uh, department and uh, MGM. I would like to uh, uh, thank especially Gadegone uh, sir for giving us an opportunity. I would also love to thank uh, Dr. Parak Lad and Dr. Abhijit for the uh, wonderful uh, clinical discussion today. I would like to thank Ashok Gorke who is there with me for such a long time uh, for organizing everything and doing a lot of uh, hand work in our department. I would like to thank my four speakers, Dr. Mannan Shah, Shah Dr. Julie Matre, Dr. Vishnu Nair and Dr. Uh, Gaurav Sharma for, for a nice presentation today. We had a wonderful uh, uh, discussion on wrist injuries and and Thanks a lot. Young surgeon. Huh? Oh, for the young surgeon, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, again, sir, uh, Vasudev, sir, this is a very good forum. So, uh, uh, I, I, I congratulate from my heart for, for giving and, uh, young surgeons. Congratulate Manoj Pahukar. He is the backbone. I know, sir. sir. Yes. Dr. Dr. Manoj. Dr. Manoj. Yeah. And oh, now I am happy to share that our Abhijit <laughs> Vaigaukar also is going to take my job further <laughs> forward with along yeah. with uh, Manoj Pahukar. Today I am very happy. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. again. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you, sir. 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 Good night, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Good night. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Agle Sunday ko only for ladies hai. For the ladies, of the ladies, by the ladies. We are starting a women's forum first webinar of its kind in Maharashtra Arthopedic Kashi. And I will recommend them, Julia, to include you also in that seminar. Good. So, thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you, sir. Good night. Good night. Good. Good. Thank you, sir.